Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of the Stone Age Gamer Podcast brought to you by Geek Life. Today's episode is called Pixelating the Future. Enjoy! God, we made it to our first episode. I am so excited right now. I can't even tell you how excited I am. It's been a long road. It has, hasn't it? I mean, I'm I'm just super pumped. I mean, everything today is is so great, and uh, and life is good. Uh, so I am Dean DeFalco, and with me is Chris Man- Randazzo. He's the god among gamers. He is uh, he's basically everything you'd want to be in a geek. Uh, so. Well, don't oversell me or anything. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know, who kind of glanced over our intro, this is the Stone Age Gamer Podcast. We'll be talking about everything retro that there is, was, and ever will be. Uh, so let's get started and jump into it. Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, just so the listeners can you know, get a feel for you and really understand what you're about. What makes you Chris Randazzo? Uh, well, um... I am uh, equal parts of the DNA of both of my parents, and I think that's pretty much what makes me Chris Randazzo. Uh, no, I, I've, um, uh, my name is Chris, as you've uh, gleaned by now. I've been a video game collector for as long as I've been uh, alive for the most part. Uh, my parents bought me an Atari 2600 Junior at a KB Toys when I believe I was six years old, and it's all been uh, kind of sparked there ever since and uh yeah i love collecting games i love playing retro games and uh sandwiches love sandwiches uh i think that pretty much sums me up awesome okay well i'm dean defalco and i mean i'm i've just been a geek since birth uh i've talked to plenty of people been to a lot of conferences played too many games to even remember started out with the sega genesis Kind of gradually fell into other things, started collecting a little bit here and there, got into the competitive game scene with uh, League of Legends and Dota 2, uh, but had to drop off of that because real life kicked in. And then I was like, you know what? I love games so much, I want to make a podcast about video games, not just any video games, the video games that made me happy as a child. And I could think of no one better to bring into that podcast than Chris Randazzo. Oh, it's very sweet of you. Chris, did you happen to mention how many games you have in your collection? I did not mention how many games I have in my collection. Uh, let's take a quick look at that, shall we? Because I don't know that number off the top of my I, head. I, I'd love to. I'd love to know that. I, I well, think that would be wonderful. According to Gamepedia, let's do a little math here. You have your calculator ready, Dean? I, I got my calculator ready. All right. According to Gamepedia, which is my uh, um, you know, catalog of all of my games. Now, granted, I have, let's say, maybe another... 20 or 30 games downstairs from a recent collection I acquired that I have not added to this yet. So this is going to be give or take like 20 or 30. So library is listed at 2,681. I need you to subtract, um, let's see, 125 because 125 of those items are game systems. Okay, all right. And then subtract... Under 190, which are uh, just another category of spare empty boxes I have. So what does that put me at? Uh, let's take a look here. 2366. So you're almost at 2400 games. The man has 2400 games in his collection, and I'd say that's pretty badass. <laughs> well, it is my life's work. So, yeah, I, I figured, you know, there, there's no one else I'd rather have that I know uh, than Chris Randazzo on this podcast because, you know, if anyone knows retro games, it's Chris. So we're happy to have him here. And, uh, all right, let's, uh, why don't we tell him about today's topic? Uh, we are going to be talking about today, uh, what is, if there is one right way to introduce someone into video games? Chris actually just had a kid. Uh, congratulations, Chris. Thank you very much. You're very uh, welcome. Th- this topic is very near and dear to me. Uh, and and the reason this came up is uh, 
we were, you know, we, Dean and I were discussing what should be our first topic about, uh, you know, on this new podcast that we're doing. And since, ever since I've had, ever since I found out my wife was pregnant, and I started telling people one of the most common questions that I got was not, oh, what are you, what are you going to name him, and and all that is, what is his first video game going to be? And that was a it turned out to be a pretty tough question to answer because what should someone's first video game be how do you when when for example when i was growing up it wasn't really there wasn't a lot of options there was my first video game was atari because that's what there was there was atari and they were these sim- simplistic games and i honestly don't remember what my first game was because uh, I was pretty young when it happened, and uh, I just remember, I remember the experience more than the specific game on the screen. I do remember the game system, and it, I feel that there's so much of that that shaped why I appreciate the games I appreciate, and it just kind of turns into a broader discussion, which I guess we're going to have right now. So that's kind of where this came from: is what's my son's first game going to be, and. I think we'll we'll try to come up with an answer today. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, just to jump right into it, uh, I kind of remember my first game actually. Uh, I started. I think I got my first system when I was five or six, and that was twenty years ago. So I remember the game. I don't really remember too much. It's a very memorable game. Most people have played it. It was a uh, Sonic Two on the Sega Genesis. It was actually bundled with the Sega Genesis, so it's very difficult not to remember. Uh, and yeah, you know, that was wonderful. Uh, being five years old, I didn't exactly have the, um, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? The hand-eye coordination that I have now. I'm so, glad you did say bladder control. Uh, it could have been bladder control. Um, I, I may or may not have, uh, you know, peed on the floor a few times while trying to beat a level. I mean, those levels were kind of tough. Uh, Sonic to me was a game that just, uh... <laughs> was a little a lot more tougher than uh Mario in my head but that's that's neither here nor there and that could be a topic for another time. Uh what I think makes a good beginner game for I guess a child would be the ability to like appreciate what it was. Uh and Chris you kind of had an idea of like what you wanted to do with this, right? I do because I've given the uh, I've given the topic a lot of thought, but um, I, I think discussing why the uh, the why I've come to that conclusion is is a well is it's, it's it would be nice to get a different perspective on it because you and I both had pretty different intros to video games. I mean, you you remember your your first video games, and it, it seems that your first video game was yours. It was actually something that you owned in your house. Correct. Um, I'm fairly certain that my first exposure to video games, and it's strange. It's something that's so important to me. I don't have a more concrete remembrance of a, you know, the way they started. But uh, I'm pretty sure that I was at my Aunt Sharon's house, Aunt Sharon and Uncle Ed, and uh, they had an Atari 2600. And I remember it being in their bedroom. And I think... I have this very I have this very specific memory and I can't say for sure that this was my first video game but I believe that my first video game may have been Pitfall. Wow, really? That's I, pretty I, cool. I remember Pitfall playing on their uh Atari and just being pretty captivated by it because it was they were controlling something on the television and that was such a unique thing at the time. It was uh I mean, especially in my little little brain. I mean, I must have been 4 or 5 years old at that point. And uh, I remember when I was when I was six. I'm pretty sure no, it was uh, it was 1986. So I must have been five years old at that point. Yeah, it was not that long after that my parents bought me the uh, the 2600 Junior. And it was no, that that can't be right. I think my time I think my timeline's a little bit off. I know I got a 2600 Junior from KB Toys, and I don't remember which games I got with it, but. Yeah, that was uh, that 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 would be my first experience with video games. Is somewhere between my aunt Sharon's house and when I got the uh, twenty six hundred Junior at home, and just being completely captivated by the fact that I could put these little cartridges in there and then I could control what was on the television, and it just it was this whole new world of imagination for me because if you've ever, I mean, I don't know how old the people who are listening to this would be, but if you back 
the day, back when Atari was the the go-to video game system, the, the graphics were little more than squares. There wasn't a whole lot of visual flourish and flair to these things, but the box art is just stunning. I mean, you look at a game like Missile Command, and it's these little blocks down on the bottom, and you move this cursor around, and you shoot lines at falling lines, and and things blow up because, you know, they blow up because these little diamond-shaped quote-unquote explosions have these lights and sounds to them that signify explosions. But then you look at the, the box art for it, and you've got this guy on a helmet, and there's some other lady, I think she's holding a clipboard, and they're launching missiles, and it seems to have it, have, it, it created this whole world. And I remember looking at the boxes for the, that and and Defender, uh, which had like some some woman getting abducted on the front, or or even Pac Man for Atari, which is you know notoriously crappy port of Pac Man. But you look at the box and you've got this character with arms and legs running, and then just the flat map in the background, almost like that background is coming to life in a three D space. And and it was that kind of stuff that made my imagination run wild in these games because then I was applying the wor- my interpretation of these worlds I saw in these gorgeous paintings on the, these box art, and I was attributing that stuff to the squares and the bleeps and the bloops on the television, and my imagination just ran wild. And, and that's how I learned to love games so much. And I wonder if because things are so different now i mean if you look at let's say let, let's grab a very contemporary idea here look at the box art for the atari 2600 version of mario brothers all right so you've got this and you've got a picture of these two cartoon dudes and they're jumping and there's red lines in the background right. and there's a little cartoon crab and, and a and a little fly and if you look at the graphics of the actual game, there's a pretty considerable difference between what this box art looks like and what's in the game. Right. Although you can kind of piece that together if you really wanted to. You can see the connect between point A to point B. Now look at the box art to New Super Mario Bros. U. It looks exactly what the game world looks like. As in you look at the front of the box and that is what you're getting in the game. And you can do that to most games. Like say uh, Assassin's Creed, you look at the front of the box – that character is going to look almost exactly like that in the game. Right. Um, conversely, if you look at, I don't know, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark for Atari 2600, <laughs> you've yeah. got Indy, you've got the Ark, you've got all these pictures, and then you look at the game, and not so much. So w- 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 there, there seems to be less of a, a, a case of imagination in modern games. Excluding indie games, right. because boy, that's a thing that I could get into. But for another it, time, for another for time. Another time. <laughs> uh, if you, you know, go, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I I was uh, gonna say. I mean, do do you feel that you know kids these days don't appreciate what video games particularly are because you know I know back when I was a kid, more so when you were uh, young, that video games weren't really such a hot commodity like they are today. Not everyone had them. You know, game stores weren't around in abundance as much as they are now. And there was no internet. So, you know, th- things for us were totally different. You know, they're, they're, if you wanted to play with someone, you, they had to come over your house. Um, you know, and it, it was a it was like an experience. You know, now I, I feel like kids take a lot of this stuff for granted, which is why I feel that it's very crucial for kids to approach games in you know the right way so they get a full appreciation from where they've been to where they are now it's an interesting interesting question see i I don't know if kids these days have a lack of appreciation for it or not um i feel old saying the phrase kids these days but i mean when you look at what's a when you when you look at some of the most popular games right now you look at something like minecraft um, that's yeah, yeah. not exactly visually exciting. It's it's yeah, all no, the, right. the game's hideous. It looks like a Nintendo sixty four game, and but it's all imagination, and it's one of the most popular games with kids. Or even look at something like Angry Birds. I mean, I don't particularly care for Angry Birds, but there's no questioning the fact that it is insanely popular, and it's not exactly a graphical powerhouse. It's just moving 
sprites for the more for, for the most part. Right, right. Um, but at the, at the same token, you look at something like that that's just so simplistic. But then you look at something like Minecraft, which is ridiculously complicated, and can somebody whose first experience is something like that can they appreciate uh, a game like uh, Donkey Kong or can they appreciate Defender um, combat and and I, mean, I guess I'll find out because I'm going to show my son all these games as soon as he's old enough and uh, I don't know I have this very this very this progression in my head of how I, I learned to play these games and, and I remember trying to play games with my parents and it never really clicked for them or even uh, playing playing games with my wife like I have such an an innate understanding of well here's this character on the screen I know exactly how to move him I have this intrinsic knowledge of how that works and it, it, it built from generation to generation you know I started right, on right. Atari and I had a joystick and a button and then when it came time to graduate to Nintendo I now had a D-pad which worked the same way as the joystick because that was easy enough to wrap my head around. But now I had two buttons and a start and select. So that took me a little bit to get used to. But once I did, I was good to go. And then I could do anything anything with the Nintendo. And then I moved on to the Super Nintendo or the Sega Genesis. But for me, I moved on to the Super Nintendo. My friends had Genesis. And it basically built on that same thing. Now I had a D-pad four buttons, shoulder buttons, and a start and select. And then I moved on to Nintendo 64, and now I've got a D-pad, six face buttons, an analog stick, a Z-trigger, and two shoulder buttons. That Z-trigger, so sexy. Yeah, and then you move on to the GameCube, which was more ergonomic, but really when you get to that point, there's they're not adding buttons and you know intrinsic differences anymore. It's just uh, refining what's already there, but... Is my appreciation for the way video games work now in a modern sense? It, it does do I have that appreciation because I learned to go from one button to five million buttons? I don't know. I, I think so. That's what makes sense to me. But I mean, kids are walking around with uh, cell phones. Kids are playing Call of Duty, and I can barely do that. So I don't know. Well, that, that's the other thing. Um, do you feel like these crazy violent games should be played by younger kids? Because uh, I, I had a stint at GameStop for a while, and I believe, Chris, you also had uh, experience in the retail side of uh, video <laughs> games as well. Yeah, and, only about 13 years of that. Yeah, <laughs> so, you know, um, do, do you feel that kids should be playing these games because I'm sure you saw plenty of kids come in and you must have just stared at them like why 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 you're you're five years old you should be playing Mario or or some sort of like just regular you know kind of decent platformer or something not this blood and gore you know steal a car kill a cop bang a hooker type of game well all right I think Grand Theft Auto is an extreme case because Grand Theft Auto does depict a certain amount of things, especially the newer ones like Grand Theft Auto Four and Five. Right, they depict things fairly realistically, mm-hmm. and you know there's lots of language and you know lots of language and lots of, I guess, malicious intent. And no, that game is very clearly not designed for kids. All and right. Well, what about no, something I'd... like uh, Call of Duty then, or Battlefield? Do you feel that's you know sufficient? Because I'm I'm kind of on the side of that could wait, you know. Uh, I, that could and should wait. I, I yeah. completely agree with you. I don't think kids should be playing. I mean, the ESRB has rated things for a reason, but right. at the same token, it's kind of up to parents. I mean, I was playing Commando back in the day, and now, granted, it's not as intense, but I was still a guy. Think of think of Commando or Gunsmoke, and either of those games, you are a person with guns in your hands, and you are shooting and killing other people. You know, in Contra, you're running around blowing up robots, but in Commando and Gunsmoke, you're killing people by the dozen, by the hundreds even. I mean, you're just walking around killing folk. Yeah, Gunsmoke, you're just mowing down people. I think it's yeah, just, just, just the entire game. <laughs> and it's not even war. It's just, you know, you're a cowboy, and you're killing dudes. Yep, yep. And now, granted, it wasn't 
um, bloody or anything, but I was still killing guys, and, and it didn't warp my brain because I got it. And I think it all really boils down to parenting. I mean, if they if you think that that game is fun and you understand that it's a game, then that would be up to the parents just of whether or not they should be allowed to play it. Now, when it comes to playing it online, I think that's a totally different animal because when you're playing it online and you're hearing all of the horrible things that people are saying online and there's no there's no sense in being exposed to that. But then again, when I was a kid, I wouldn't have enjoyed that. Right. I I, I did not seek out those kinds of experiences. So I I think <sighs> you know uh well, you know, we'll 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 keep the online stuff for another time. Um Yeah, this that, the, the, that's a whole other animal. ESRB and whether or not kids should play violent games is a is a discussion for another time. Yeah. Um but do you think there are any advantages to starting with older vintage games compared to you know newer modern games? I think so because all right when I think back to some of my favorite gaming experiences, a lot of what made them amazing to me was seeing how new technology changed them um Super Mario Brothers is a really easy example to go from Super Mario Brothers to Super Mario World and have it kind of look more colorful and bright and vibrant. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. But the the two ones that really stick out to me would be the Zelda series and more most specifically the Metroid series. So I'll call out Metroid first. Okay. The original Metroid, um, when I first got my Nintendo, I had that giant Now You're Playing With Power poster. Oh, and it was – oh, man, that poster was so cool. And I wanted to know more about every game that was on that poster. Kind of like when, when I got my Atari games, they came with these great catalogs that had just you – know, here's a catalog of all these games that we published and it's just super cool stuff. And I remember looking at Metroid and thinking, wow, that game looks really cool. And then seeing, them in the, seeing the game in the pages of Nintendo Power and just seeing how big the game was and how interesting and intricate the world was. And when I finally got the game, I just I sat down and I spent several hours just walking around this world and learning the planet. I believe it's pronounced Zebes. I, I think you got that Zebes. Yeah, it's 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 weird, but looking at the planet Zebes and just learning it, it, the way it worked and and how everything connected, and it it felt like you had this sense of isolation and the strange music and, but it was still. I saw these illustrations from the instruction manuals and Nintendo Power, and I filled in all those blanks, and that was really cool. Then you move on to Metroid 2, which was on Game Boy, which was in some ways a visual step back just because it was black and white, but in a lot of ways a step forward because the art design, specifically on the main character Samus, was really cool. Right. You know, this is where Samus got the big shoulder pads on the various suit because there was no way to differentiate the color of her suit changing in the Game Boy. So they had to give it some sort of visual difference. Right. And going through this whole different planet, SR388, it, it opened up the universe of the, the Metroid universe because, well, it doesn't just have to be Mother Brain on Zebes. It's now we go to where the Metroids came from. We're going to eradicate them. And you're basically committing genocide this whole time. Like you, you don't don't even think about it. But like we're we're wiping out a species. No, nah, yeah. And that always kind of like rung to me when I got to the end because you know you you fight these creatures and they're just out to kill you and these 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 hideous monsters and then you fight the queen and it's like this this pretty nasty battle and you blow up the queen and then you run into the egg and this is just one of the absolute triumphs of game design is that. I got what was going on. Like you run into this this little Metroid egg, it hatches, and the Metroid starts circling around you. And at first, I thought it was attacking me, but then I realized it wasn't. I was like, "This is does this thing think I'm its mother?" And I walked over to this wall, and it killed this wall so that I could walk through. And and I made it all the way back to my ship with this little baby Metroid. I was like, "Oh, well, that's that's really cute. I saved this little baby Metroid at the end, and it's." It's not evil. It's just a creature, and it does what it does. So that was really neat. Now, enter Super Metroid, and and this is where it just absolutely melted my brain because the graphics and the sound on oh, the Super Nintendo oh my God. was just a, such a leap forward 
but it was the same planet. You're going – first off, you have that amazing opening sequence mm-hmm. where you fight Ridley and Ridley just looks so much cooler than he ever did on the NES. Oh, he yeah. just looks amazing and he steals the baby Metroid and I'm already invested because I saved that little thing and now it's stolen. And when as soon as I follow that thing back to planet Zeebs and you see her ship landing. Mm-hmm. See, in the first game, you never saw the ship. Second game, you saw the ship, but it only stood still. Right. Now I get to see the ship in full color landing on a planet. Mm-hmm. And I get out, and it's raining, and I take a step to the left, and there's actual water coming off of Samus's feet as she walks across the ground. And then you, get, you go into, a, you go into the, the criteria, as it were. You find your way down this cavern. And then you wind up where the bomb went off at the end of the first Metroid. And it looks amazing because it's laid out exactly the same, except now there's a background instead of a you know, flat black. And it's all destroyed and smoky because you set off a giant bomb there. And you go into the next room and there's the remains of Mother Brain and all the uh, machinery surrounding her. And it looks so amazing because it looks more like what you imagined it looking like when you were playing the NES game. And then you go down another elevator and you find yourself in the exact same room in Brinstar as the very first screen of the original Metroid. Right. But now it looks so much more alive, even though it's completely dead and hollow and, and you're all by yourself. This is now that exact world, the exact layout, and it just looks so much different. Now, if I looked at that for the first time and I had never had any experience with the prior series, then I I don't know that it would be as impressive to me. I mean, I'm sure it would still look nice to me. It would still look appealing because it is artistically phenomenal. Right. But I had this look of now what I'm seeing on the screen is so much closer to what I saw in my imagination, what I imagine this world really looks like. And seeing that come to fruition is you can't experience that if you're going from new to old you know if i start on metroid prime and then or better yet if i start on sonic generations and then i go back (laughs) and play sonic (laughs) one that world's not going to look as impressive to me but if you start on sonic one and then play the green hill zone in sonic generations that's really freaking cool yeah because step up that's the green hill zone, but realized kind of getting back to what I was saying about the Atari games and the box art. It's, it's watching video game technology catch up to your imagination is a remarkable experience. And I think that seeing that, seeing that happen and, uh, I, I think getting to experience that kind of evolution makes you appreciate uh, it makes you appreciate the worlds that are built in games a lot more. But only if that's what you appreciate about games. Because if you're playing Call of Duty, you're not really interested in the box art. You're not interested in a fantasy world. You're interested in this gaming experience where you're you're killing guys and, right. and stuff. So I, I, I guess it really depends on what you want to get out of your games. I, I get where you're coming from. But uh, to tie this up into kind of a, a neat bow uh anyway for this part uh i i kind of look at it almost like you know you're watching a movie you know you, you were talking about you you played the first one you know you, you you got through the whole story and everything you played the second one you found this little baby metroid that you rescued and then in super metroid ridley takes it and everything you you got like emotional attachment to this that's like watching lord of the rings you know all the way through and you have attachment to these characters and everything because you've been watching them for three movies, you know. And at the end, you know they're they're all like separating, and going all their ways, and you have like all these like attachments to them. Like you you know these people. They you've been observing them, you know. I, I guess through I guess what would you call it? I guess narrator's eye. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't know what to call that, but I, I you know viewing as the audience, you know you're you're taking that third person view and you're seeing everything that happens to them. That's kind of a big thing, and the fact that you can do that in a video game and you're the, that person, you know, controlling everything only makes it that much more immersive, which I feel is so cool and so amazing. Uh, and we're gonna be running a little long here, so 
that's fine because it's the first episode and we can do that because we make the rules here. Damn at, right. At the Stone Age Gamer podcast, <laughs> and no boss of Geek Life is going to tell me otherwise. I got a hint though. I'm the boss, so I can do what I want. Uh, so, Chris, why don't you tell us uh, what you want John to to play first? Well, all right. So, uh, a lot of people assumed, well, it's probably going to be Super Mario Brothers. Now, Super Mario Brothers wouldn't be a bad choice because uh, you know it's a pretty basic premise. It's easy, easy to learn, difficult to master, but it's a little bit. There's a lot to it. I wanted to go back a little bit further, so then I think my first experience was an Atari game. What should John's first experience be? An Atari game. So I'm, my son's name is John, by the way. <laughs> I um I thought about Pitfall, and while Pitfall is a, a, a a thing where you move a character. You also have to move a character up and move a character down. And I want the first thing to be just the most quintessential gaming experience. So then I thought maybe Pong, but Pong is a, it's a two player experience and it's really, it's just tennis. Pong is something that you can just do. It's, 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 you know, ping pong, it's tennis. It's, it's, it it is akin to a thing in real life. I wanted something with a, a touch of the fantasy to it. Mm-hmm. And then it hit me that the proper first game, and I'll even explain why, is Space Invaders. And I want to go with the Atari 2600 version for a couple of reasons. Okay, that that I I kind of do want to hear because that, that sounds really awesome. Uh, and, I mean, Space Invaders is just such a classic that, like, I kind of – I we need to virtually high-five right now. So I'm going to make the clapping <laughs> noise, and you could just go along like we high-five. Boom! That was a Done. high five right there. Okay, that was a good so, one. Yeah. So, <laughs> please uh, go go on explaining this because I, I I think this is going to be really interesting. All right. So Space Invaders. When you think about it, it really boils down what you do in a video game. I mean, in most video games, in some way, shape, or form, there is an attack. Like if you're Mario, you shoot fireballs, so you're actually using projectiles, or you're stomping on bad guys. In sports games like football, you are throwing a football, and that is technically a projectile. Same with soccer or any any sports game. There is some sort of thing that comes out of one thing and heads to another. So there is projectiles in, in, in all forms. You have movement of a character, which is the little ship. You move left and right. So you don't have to worry about any other axis like in Centipede where you have to move up and down, left and right. You just have to worry about move left, move right. There's strategy involved because you have to hide behind things and you have to, you know, shoot the right things in the right order otherwise they'll just keep coming down faster and faster and right. there, there's their strategy to it there's skill to it and it really gives you the basic core of what it means to be playing a video game and I think that nothing really exemplifies the ba- very basic basics of gaming better than Space Invaders now, the most specifically why I said the uh, Atari 2600 version is not just because it has a couple of really good um, difficulty settings where you can change the size of your ship and everything. That stuff's really cool. But really, the main reason that you should give a child Space Invaders for Atari 2600 as their first video game experience is that every time they die, it makes a fart noise. <laughs> You know what? Every, every every kid would like that, and I that's totally a reason to get a kid to play a game because something as crappy as dying is kind of diffused by a fart noise. Absolutely. I mean, my sister and I used to play Berserk for Atari all the time, and we would just walk into walls and die because it was hysterical to watch the stick figure get electrocuted. <laughs> and uh, let's see. You have to do a YouTube search of Space Invaders – and hear that sound effect when the when you die, and it is a, uh, it's just wonderful. <laughs> I, I can only imagine, and I tell you what, for all our viewers, we will include a uh, link in our show notes so you guys can check that out. Because that's what we do. We're we're the informative type of people who get you links for fart noises from the Atari Twenty Six Hundred only <laughs> here on the Stone Age Gamer Podcast. Only here. <laughs> you heard Subscribe it first. now. <laughs> Subscribe now. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, that, that's really awesome. I think that's such a good reason to, to have that game in specific be the game that you want John, your kid, to play. Because, 
you're you're right. It totally exemplifies, you know, all the basics of a, you know, or the core of what every game video game video should have. Video game should have uh, you know, it, it's it's got everything and I I really think that's perfect. Uh there there probably couldn't have been any better games to pick than that. And you're right, Mario Brothers is kind of like jumping into a seven foot pool when you don't know how to swim. So, yeah, I, you know what that that's I totally agree with that. And fart noises on the Atari 2600 make it even better. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> so I think that wraps it up. Uh, do, you, do you have anything else to add uh, as far as uh, the first first game for any child or, you know, any well, thoughts on this? Well, this? Th- this is what I came up with, and I'm curious what anybody else would come up with. Um, do any of you have... Uh, a better idea, a different idea. What would you do with your kids if uh, if video games are as important to you as they are to me? How would you introduce them to your child? Uh, I'm. I would love to hear what anybody else thinks of this. You know what? That would be great. Actually, we have a convenient email that you guys can email us at. That's a uh, geeklifesite at gmail dot com. I'll put it in the show notes. So all you guys have to do is go check out our website. That's uh www.g33klife.com www.geeklife.com for those of you who want me to say it as well as spell it out <laughs> um we'll have the show notes there you can also get a link to the iTunes description of our episodes and everything there as well and other podcasts that we'll be doing in the future so uh definitely check that out remember to follow us on Facebook because we're going to have tons of content that we'll be announcing through there. So if you guys are don't aren't really at home or anything, you could just check us out on your phone on Facebook and hit the link, you know, get to our show notes or our podcast, download the episode and to subscribe to us. You should probably just subscribe to us. Chris, I think that's the easier thing to do, right? Isn't it just to subscribe? I couldn't agree more. Of course. You should just subscribe. It's a nice little button. We got a whole big, nice podcast album picture that goes right next to it. You'll get the picture on on the podcast when you're listening to it. It's it's really nice, too. It's a, Chris, it's a dinosaur. It's a dinosaur with glasses and a controller. That's amazing. I made it with love. <laughs> anyway, I guys. promise we'll get better at this, folks. Totally, totally. <laughs> Or or worse, you know, either or. But Chris, uh, you had something to add, didn't you? Oh yeah, um, you know, just the interest interest of plugging things. Uh, if you want to find out more about me and how I feel about things, uh, you can definitely look me up in Nintendo Force Magazine. Uh, I do a reoccurring column called Peripheral Vision, um, where I re- visit uh, the games and peripherals for Nintendo systems that are just unique to their own. Era, uh, starting with uh, my first article, is in the current issue of Nintendo Force magazine, available at nintendoforce.com. Uh, and that would be issue eight, which is all about Mario Kart 8 and uh, the road to it. Just has a nice little, in addition to my article about the Power Pad, uh, which are I, wherein I go into detail on every Power Pad game ever made, uh, which is, I think, six or seven off the top of my head. I can't remember. But, six whole yeah, games. Was, yeah, it was fun, and it is a very, very strange, strange library of games where you do all sorts of stuff from building giant burgers to uh, racing against animal-headed, creepy people, and uh, you know, ride a raft down a river. And there's there's a lot of weird games for the power pad, especially dance aerobics. But uh, yeah, um, besides my article, there's a retrospective on uh, the Mario Kart series as a whole. Um, there's a character profile on Rosalina um, and just a lot of really, really great content. Uh, if you had any love for Nintendo Power, uh, if anybody had been reading that towards the end of its run, it was really a very solid magazine. I know when it started out, it was kitschy uh, Nintendo propaganda, which was glorious in its own right. But by the time that magazine ended, it was legitimately outstanding. Like It was well-written, well-edited, a lot of really interesting articles, interviews, and uh, Nintendo Force continues that legacy with as much respect as anyone possibly could. It's got some of the best uh, Nintendo writers on the internet. Uh, Lucas Thomas, uh, there's there's people from Go Nintendo, 
uh, Nintendo World Report, Destructoid, all all these folks involved, and it's uh, really really something special, and I'm honored to be part of it. So, uh, and it is a print magazine. It is available digitally, but it is also available in print, which I highly recommend because print magazines are awesome. So yeah, NintendoForce.com, check it out. Yeah, guys, definitely do that because I mean, I do it. You guys should do it too. I mean, I'm kind of awesome. You guys want to be awesome. It's a no-brainer. So <laughs> um, with that, check us out. Back here in a couple weeks, we'll be talking about, I think, promos and propaganda from Nintendo, Sega, uh, all the way back to arcade stuff. It should be really interesting. We're going to have some great content for you. Uh, and again, remember to check our website. Again, this is the Stone Age Gamer Podcast. Hang back with us uh, in a couple weeks. Till then, stay classy. Have a good one. <laughs>